Thank you, um, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you for the invitation. So my talk is a, a written-down paper reflecting on turbid media, and the intelligence of liquid crystals with lots of images in case um, the words are not gripping. Oops, sorry. So information is liquid. It moves around, gets exchanged, siphoned off, or it leaks. Its packet streams trickle out through timing channels. But information is crystal, or it is stored in crystals, in organic semiconducting materials which make computer chips and should hold it tight and fixed, like the crystal is, but should also let information reflect glitteringly in the world, refracted through crystalline materials, through screens of smartphones, desktops, laptops, devices of all kinds, sometimes glass on glass. Information is liquid crystal. These are the entities. This is the phase of matter that enables the intelligence of machines but it also allows the intelligence of everything, enables everything to know and be known, for the liquid crystal is everywhere. Liquid crystals are in your pockets. Liquid crystals are in your clothes, in silk and in Kevlar. Liquid crystals are on your mood-ringed fingers, in the sludge at the bottom of your soap dish, in snail slime and insect wings. Liquid crystals are in lip gloss and anti-wrinkle gel. Liquid crystals are in the mantles of ne neutron stars responding to tidal pull. <coughs> Liquid crystals are eaten in gluten and drunk in the phospholipids of milk. A virus may be liquid crystal. Liquid crystals are inside you, working on the hair cells of the inner ear, transporting fats in cilia, in lung and sinus tissue, in cell membranes, in polypeptides, in our epithelial tissues, which line the cavities and surfaces of organs throughout the body, and in DNA. These liquid crystals take us out of and into ourselves. The liquid crystal phase is an intermediate form of matter which can form complex, self-replicating, ordered structures and macromolecules. It self-assembles, packs, shows defects, has functionalities and processability. It has been submitted that on the earth of the prebiotic era, matter possessing the properties of liquid crystals was an antecedent in the evolution of living matter from inanimate matter. In its lyotropic form, it maintains the processes of life thereafter. These liquid crystals even seem to have human-like fingerprints. Liquid crystals have long been everywhere, but they were only named and probed and played with and set to work in the years following 1888, when investigations of their cloudy phase indicated a certain order at work, even if an unfamiliar order, for the cloudy phase has, liquid crystal, has crystalline properties, though it is also fluid. The broken time of light contained in the liquid crystal conjures a kaleidoscope under polarized lenses. These forms can be engineered, as in this animated model of a liquid crystal dendrimer. The liquid crystal medium is makeable. For those who stuck over many years with this intermediate state, this interference in the conventional order of solid liquid gas, there were more discoveries to be made, such as the realization in the 1930s that liquid crystals could be oriented by electrical fields. This made it possible to find applications for these forms, new purposes in the world. In 1936, the first liquid crystal patent was granted to Marconi Limited in Britain, for light valves to be used in the new media of television and facsimile telegraph. In the USA, at Radio Corporation of America, research began in the 1950s on how to use liquid crystal responsiveness to electrical fields. 
their exceptional responsivity to excitation, to make display technologies, ones in which the wall pictures moved and mutated without rest. It is not the liquid crystal's polychromatous dazzle that provides the flitting colours on an LCD screen. Rather, a twisting, pneumatic liquid crystal cell operates as a light shutter, rotating or not rotating the plane of polarisation, depending on the application of voltage. The early LCD uses made this service function clearer, for they were only dark grey lozenges on the light grey gleam of a backdrop, backdrop screen in a 1972 Gruen Teletime LCD watch or the like. Liquid crystals are light modulating media. Liquid crystal is intimate with media. Liquid crystals found their way into display devices in a massive industry dominated by Samsung, Sharp and LG Philips, Sony and the rest developed. Liquid crystal in its thermotropic form holds life prisoner of the screen. The liquid crystals of many of these screens, the TVs, computers, tablets, smartphones, projectors, cameras, are still synthesized there where their first scientist commissioned them in 1904 at Merck in Darmstadt, Germany. Here is an image of their new factory for liquid crystal window, window modules in Veldhoven, Netherlands. On this liquid crystal earth, in these liquid crystal cities, liquid crystal agitations on screens are gazed at more often than a lover's eyes. The screen is liquid crystal and it contracts all history, all social interaction, all data and all fantasy to swim across it, under it, gleaming on it. Every window is becoming a screen. A glass that can make itself cloudy in a trice when an electrical supply compels liquid crystal molecules to randomly orient, scattering light and producing privacy, long dreamed of covertness. All our windows will be screens. All our screens are operating systems. The language of computing has reprogrammed the matter of life. The cities are luminous. We log on to them. Merck explores new uses for their most profitable output as rival technologies such as OLEDs appear and challenge the predominance of liquid crystals in TVs. Dimmable window panes or flat antennas on car roofs that electronically home in on satellites. The window that was will be no more. Car manufacturers and industry analysts agree that vehicles will become entertainment centres that concept starts with replacing windows with screens. Not only can the car's many cameras show you what is outside, but the view can be enhanced by augmented reality. The car can also de deliver an immersive virtual reality. Intel and Warner Brothers are already collaborating to make in-car VR experiences the next evolution in movies. And the shop enters the car. In advertisement suggestions from the AI concierge, for places to stop and buy en route. An AI-driven vehicle ceases to be just a vehicle. It can be anything. And as technology has transformed the concept of retail, it can transform a car ride into a shop on wheels, said Kiki Diwali, senior vice president of commerce for every device at MasterCard. The store is no longer beholden to its four walls. It's in your home office where your desktop is. It's in your pocket where your smartphone is. And now it'll be on the road. Artifact intelligence. If liquid and crystal is everywhere and well distributed, is our medium in which we <coughs> float and bump, it should be evident that liquid and crystal have joined forces, at least metaphorically, with the other phase of matter, with gas, with clouds of gas. Liquid and crystal align with the airy metaphorics of the cloud, where all, meta, where all information, data sets, arrives and all intelligence is exerted, not just in analyses, but in learning, deep learning, so that futures may be predicted and, in being predicted, become actual. This cloud is a public cloud, or better, a resource for private corporations, governments and the surveillance industry, 
a wad ever expand, expanding of unstructured data of pixels of apprehensible content. Think about the cloud and it encompasses you and you, then you are in a fog. Not just the fog of the London or any other urban particular or particulate, the fog of pollution, bad air, of our atmospheric gases suffused with particles of dust. Not the fog of too much moisture on the land. The fog that surrounds us now is a blurry, all-encompassing <coughs> atmosphere in which nothing can be seen, nothing mapped, nothing communicated, at least not for us. Not just the fog of tear gas, whose profits are surely soaring currently. <coughs> Rather, I'm talking of the fog of computing. This fog makes us blind. Our many devices, perhaps not though. And the fog in computing terms comes to be a new phenomenon, a new nature. Just as John Ruskin's storm cloud of the 19th century, his plague cloud, black cloud, was seen by him quite precisely as a new natural phenomenon brought about by social and moral and economic forces. The fog of fog computing is being worked on in our environs as cities adopt the protocols of smart cities, smart infrastructure, services, data collection and analysis, the internet of things, all swirled in a soup of intelligence Hyped as if it were like the primal one that cooked up a plasma that became human, it is as if liquid, crystal, gas combine to form a turbid medium through which we pass, in which we breathe, a turbid digital environment of the device. An internet of things sets objects in communication with each other, and out of their needs to communicate comes the fog of tangles and capacitors, which becomes a network, a smart grid, a fogging that might lend itself to other vague uses, compute power, storage of data, applications. These are brought closer to the location where data is gathered, the results, the outputs distributed, but held near, not alienated into the far-off cloud, but surrounding us, all about. We are within. It is without us, perhaps in all senses. This is a foggy intelligence, one close to the military and to for-profit entities. Here in the fog, efficiencies of processing occur, quick results, securely held, short-term analytics. Things in a fog, we too, in a fog. A fog made in San Francisco, Cisco, now available locally. These metaphors of fog, for this is what they are, take off, roll in like clouds and haze, come to remake language and imagination. And if we were to think about mapping our world, about cognitive mapping, about getting our bearings now in the fogging, would we say that it runs in two ways? One is that the precision is possible and absolute for we all, or at least our devices all, always stand at a triangulation of forces, a location that is forever monitored and known, and not just by us, but by all those parties interested in our movements, more tracked than a Storky or a Stasi person of interest. This fog that is everywhere is pervasive, is also a technique of tracking, of location, precisely in space and time, and we are never more found than now in the fog of computers, which know where we are better than we ourselves do, but also it runs in the opposite way. We've never been more lost, more unaware of where we are, and what also occupies our space, maps it cognitively, intelligently, and to what ends this is done. Our own devices. <coughs> Liquid crystals inhabit our devices, which proliferate, even if not always in plain sight. The device is everywhere, and it does more and more. We have accommodated ourselves to the device, to devices, especially to those that require our gestures, our touches. Devices need us as much as we need them. Our bodies complete their circuits. A circuit based on capacitance has been most effective to date with the human working as a conductor as the finger strokes the glass. We work for the machine in touching it. The touch that touch screens rely on makes of the body an instrument. The device captures gestures through its microsensors. 
Our touch corrals liquid crystals into certain pathways to make things happen, to trigger events. They orient themselves according to inputs. We and they learn a new gestural vocabulary. These gestures that we make towards our devices make connections between us and between the events that are triggered on and through the screen. They connect, but they divide too. Our devices divide us. A device is a gadget, a vaguely defined technical thing that does something, usually by mechanical or electrical power. Some devices are known as suspect, like the one designed to rip through the air and brick at the Grand Hotel in Brighton in 1984, which nearly killed Margaret Thatcher. A suspect device is a name for a bomb. This bomb shattered what was around it, as if the crystal of life <coughs> that held everything together, could be broken into so many parts. Its trigger was detonated by a long delay timer made from video cassette recorder components and a parking meter reminder signal called a memo park timer device. Nowadays, dumb or smartphones are the triggers for remote controlled improvised explosive devices in a gesture of politics of terrorism. A device is divisive in etymological terms. The word comes from the late 13th century Old French, derived from the Latin divisus, that which has been divided. When goods were being divided between people, a mark known as a device, which took the form of an emblem, was put on each item to show whose was whose. A device is something that belongs to someone as an act of division, a device may also be <coughs> literary, such as those devices a rhetorician or author might employ to gain best effect or an advantage. Devices are things that separate, divide and mark out. The device poses a contradiction. Our gestures must be common enough to be read by the machine. And the machine is our device, our own one. We possess it, it possesses us. It is there to divide us into our own bubbles of social labour. We are also to be divided against ourselves. Our gestures are not ours. They belong to the machine. Liquid crystals facilitate them, <coughs> their gestures corralled into simple flickings of switches on and off. There's work at pace on flexible screens now, liquid crystal-based ones whose soft properties allow for moulding, which donates the ability to wrap them around our machines and our bodies. We, we will become layer upon layer of liquid crystal, our liquid crystal bodies clothed in liquid crystals, us as walking advertisements emitting a greeny or grey glowing bloom, like the one cast by the crackly gaslight of the old arcades a glaucous gleam, an erratic greenish glow over everything, but mainly over what we were requested to look at, to don't touch but buy and then buy again. We will be smart only then as we navigate our turbid environs, our turbulent interfaces, our image worlds, our screens, our internet of things, we humans, a strolling, distributed, networked internet of things, all clouded and fogged, imaged somewhere at all times, intelligently connected, wrapped in our new auras, in the gassy, cloudy, turbid phase of matter that seems to matter now. A turbidity which is, after all, the signature of the liquid crystal, a cloudiness that signalled its presence in the world. Fog is turbid, <coughs> dust swirling in air is turbid, mud eddied into water is turbid, media can be turbid. Here's a pun. Turbid media is the name given by physicists to muddy water or particularly polluted air in which the particles of poisonous dust are so dense as to be visible. Turbidity makes for foggy water or hazy atmospheres 
how to think about turbid media, not just from the perspective of the physicist measuring propagation of light and other optical properties for determined ends, thinking of water or air as a medium in which something is suspended, how to think of it as a medium, a turbid one of thickly intelligent folks and smart particles, how is it possible or desirable to see from the perspective of a viewer speculating on a moment of optical engagement in which particles float on the air, granules churn in water, a moment in which there is apprehension of turbid matter in apparent self-generated movement or pixels scattering widely. And this media becomes the air or water as a screen, a medium, or the particles themselves become media, the very stuff out of which an artistic articulation is produced. Would that be a reviewing of these new swirling materials, these gassy forms, these effervescent liquid crystals that seep around us unseen, animate our devices, substitute for our intelligence, or siphon it off as outputs and inputs for other intelligences? This endless resource of data includes emotional data, the logging of likes, loves, the sharing and caring online, which lends its outputs to robots and software so they might develop emotional intelligence. This is not seen as work and yet it produces profits. It is as excavatable and capturable as any element. In the field of um, emotional intelligence, the work of psychologist Paul Ekman has been central. From the 1960s, Ekman has collated nonverbal behaviours and micro-expressions, establishing a facial action coding system, results of which are passed on to companies, governments, spiritual leaders and law enforcement agencies. The rationale for much of the work is the visual detection of lies by the camera, which itself is said to never lie. This finds a recent use in the iBorder control robots to be test deployed on the borders of Latvia, Greece and Hungary. The project sets itself in the context of growth in movement across borders and the so-called increased threat of illegal immigration exerting pressure on border guards. Dr. Keely Crockett, a member of the European Consortium developing the iBorder Control software at Manchester Metropolitan University, said, iBorder Control technology uses artificial intelligence to detect micro-gestures and other telltale signs of lying, making our borders safer for anyone who intends harm and speeding up security checks for the majority of travellers. The robot border guard is emotionally intelligent and will become more so, more than us. It decides whose face fits and who is telling lies to gain access to the EU. An avatar poses questions as it evokes software for face matches and processes fingerprints and palm vein technologies, while also analysing non-verbal micro-expressions and micro-gestures iBorder Control deploys well-established as well as novel technologies together to collect data that will move beyond biometrics and onto biomarkers of deceit. Machine talks to human and assesses its gestures. Machine watches human and learns its gestures. Robots have been trained to make gestures as they speak, just like humans. They learn their gestures from TED Talks. But the gestures called forth by TED Talks are not human ones as such. They're more like Duchenne's compelled gestures. As Marx worked on Capital in 1862, drawing his analysis of alienation into a network of economic relations that generated it, Duchenne du Boulogne wrote, the mechanism of human facial expression. On the muscular basis of emotional states, at least the impression of such, with photographs and discussion of the use of electrical currents directed at certain muscles of the face, muscles of joy, muscles of sadness, of surprise and fright. 
body and emotions are hinged naturally, and also as a capacity that can be forced to produce. The machine's attention exacts specific emotions by activating muscles that contort the face. These generated emotional states are likely not felt or experienced internally. The frame in which they're induced, electrical shocks, cold metal spikes and so on, would likely induce other emotional reactions. The textbook is an early example of how it's possible, certainly in the age of the photograph or machinic stare, to make a database of emotions that will lend itself to becoming operative. Emotional life can be produced and reproduced as image. Charles Darwin used some of the images in his 1872 <coughs> volume, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. The shock-inducing apparatus had been erased in the reproductions for print. These muscular contractions become evidence of felt states. They're mere gestures, physical responses elicited by mechanics. AI's gestures are learnt, a performance of surface appearance. And yet the human gestures of TED Talks were learnt by those who could attune themselves to the requirements of the medium in order to appear sincere, learned, engaging, attractive. Huffington Post writer Vanessa Van Edwards in her piece Five Secrets of a Successful TED Talk noted a correlation between the number of hand gestures a speaker makes in a talk and the number of views the talk receives. The gesture must appear. It's mandatory for success. It captures the viewer's attention. It produces trust. The inspirational speaker must learn this. The robot must learn this. Viewers must unlearn this and perceive it as natural. The gestures are so natural. These gestures are a medium and it should be a transparent one. They occur in a turbid environment though, with the dust in a cloud turned hazy fog in a spill of agitated liquid crystal. The intelligence of pixel fairy dust. The digital epoch changes everything. We're asked to imagine the redundancy of humans in the face of digital machines and robots. This redundancy is likely to be less a making invisible and more an increased visibility. Humans as underactive fleshiness, as problems, as recipients of phony universal basic incomes, as consumers at any cost, because that is the rationale of the system. Those new machines can make anything. They use their digital clays to mould anything that can be imagined and things that have never been. New developments make it possible to model even viscous, semi-soft things. But this is slow, as slow as craft ever was. Those digital plastics build up layer upon layer through wobbling nozzles, leaking thin and tiny blobs. This is a new craft, one crafty enough by itself to seem not to need humans, but perhaps what is created, because the human will not go away, is a Kraftfeld, a force field, a relational electrical field or a magnetic or gravitational one, a force field which is a region of space around a body, around the machine, which, as with a charged particle, exerts a force on other bodies not in contact with it. So the digital machines exude a force across the whole of society and sometimes we touch them and even when we are not touching, our worlds are still being reshaped and remade for us because many devices are not at our fingertips or right there, but they are at that point no longer for us. <coughs> to exist in modern society is to exist within the liquid crystal matrix that generates a fog of data streams. <laughs> and crystal pixel points of artificially intelligenced events. Can this fog of data streams and crystal nodes be seen or visualized? Some sort of fog or haze at least might surface digitally. The turbid dust of a polluted region or sand on the move is mapped and tracked digitally. Its future moves predicted in the quest for intelligence as particulate marries with pixels and digital visualization pairs with analysis. Digital image making is drawn to the dust, the particulate. It finds ways 
to make detectable effinescence, such as the stress factors on a curve, the agitation of the air, clouds, the wind, and turn it into outputs, into measurement, as in the von Kármán vortex streaks made by NASA's multi-angle imaging spectroradiometer. Dust's movements can be tracked in digital mapping programs, visualized and analyzed. The dispersion of the virtually imperceptible, its behaviors over time, its pixelated parades can be brought to light. Dust has always been one of the plagues of photography. Dust on negatives, lenses, inside cameras. It's even more irritating in the digital world. The electrical charges within cameras draw dust particles in like a magnet, and these will appear in every image thereafter. And digital photography is especially susceptible to backscatter or retro reflection of light off dust or other particles in air or water, which appears as orbs of transparent white or rainbow circles floating in the image. But dust becomes metadata. Facebook build knowledge of social relationships and make it lucrative people you may know suggestions by correlating the dust on photographs, which indicates the various images were taken by the same camera. The matter phase of the digital is an attraction to the gaseous fog, to an airy gas that's palpable because it's rich with dust, because it tracks those dusty worlds of tiny movements useful to science and measurement because it sees the dust, even when the dust should not be seen. The erratic that was at photographer's birth, as Walter Benjamin identified it, returns otherwise. Not as the mist of an imperialism, happy to be named as such, and through which subjects peer, but rather in the clouded air of industrial farming's dirt tracks, the loss of topsoil from irresponsible changes in land use, the increase in pollution, which looks like this, or this. The military knows about dust, smart dust, about how this swirl of tiny matter could be tiny electronic spies, pixelish electronic wads of power, sensors, computing, and communications, electronics, low cost and plentiful enough to scatter like dust sense the environment, communicate with each other, gather and process data, be an intelligence. Some dust is not smart, it's old dust or dead dust. If you take the deep learning out of Facebook today, Facebook's dust, Lacan, Facebook's chief AI scientist recently told CNN Business, it's entirely built around it now. <coughs> Atomic intelligence. Scientific speculators dream of third nature, third nature, design nature, proposes a seemingly magical or nightmarish world that exists only as a result of infrastructures that are highly capitalized. At its more fantastical ends, it provides extraordinary images of the world remade from the atom up, according to the digital command. In 1965, Ivan Sutherland imagined a room in which Computers can control the existence of matter. The extension of this vision is the idea of the whole world, of each particle in this world infused by liquid crystal digital prowess. The idea of radical atoms, such as is promulgated at MIT by Hiroshi Ishii and the Tangible Media Group, proposes a world remade from the bottom up, responsive at human command, Pass through digitation that shadows this new atomic world or is its shell, its underworking, its doubling. Physical objects have a limitation, remain too fixed, their properties immutable, they're too solidly crystalline. Liquidity, transformability needs to be engineered into the very substance that forms them. The liquid crystals that have been for some time the basis of all reproduced images or digital objects, optics, become the thing itself. The entire world becomes image, and the entirety of images become world. These odd physical chemical components, liquid crystals, lend themselves to complex systems approaches, and as, as they are apprehended, it is as if the world might be recast in their image, instead of images being cast by them. The atom is changed. The atom responds to inputs. The atom outputs. 
These inputs and outputs are targeted at a human in the vision of radical atoms. Atoms are re-engineered through the idea of the liquid crystal. They're to be brought out of their current static and inert states to active and kinetic dimensions, according to the experimenters at MIT. That is to say, atoms are to be instilled with properties of liquidity and crystallinity with a certain sliminess, an ability to move and to move between states, to have form and to deform. Radical atoms are a dream of pixels released into the environment. P pixels made 3D and ubiquitous. They congregate to make forms and materials that can transform their shape, color, properties through digital or other stimuli heat, light, sound. The atom has a coded intelligence. Ubiquitous computing or the screen as pervasive, animation as everywhere, manifests not in terms of the visibility of devices. Um, else, not in terms of the visibility of devices, of LCD screens, but rather subtly, faux magically, an impelling which is barely perceptible, but is knowable in the form of an invisible suture between material and com computation on the premise of responsive materials which transform one type of energy into another. It is as yet fictional digital clay, an extension of the flatness of pixel painting into the dimensionality of sculpture, a clay that can be directly manipulated by human hands, <coughs> deformed and transformed, which sends back signals to an underlying digital model. The human becomes an input, a physical inputer of information. At the same time, this digital clay can conform in response to a computer directive. Solid shape transforms before watching eyes into another shape, changes color, moves, dances. An umbrella changes form and softness depending on wind direction or amount of rain. A screwdriver senses the screw head shape and readjusts accordingly. And when some digital clay is rolled by clumsy human hands into a ball, it snaps into a perfect sphere. Another object comes close, it links to it using Boolean addition. <coughs> if it is cut in half, one side can mirror the other. In this scenario, energy from the temperature of the body, from the light of the environment, could be extracted as a power source for devices a radicalization of its current use within the circuitry of the touchscreen device. They would charge as we exist, as we emanate from ourselves holding them, and they exist then without the tangle of wires, transformers, sockets. Ubiquity is coexisting or synonymous with each cell of our body, each fluctuation of our body temperature, each shadow we cast or remove. The bleeding edge of technology is the prospect of technology, not just on the body, at the fingertips, on the skin, not just on the screens and in the multiple devices around us, but rather integrated into every atom of the world, each atom whose capacities are augmented so that they might account for phases from fixed to flowing from liquid to crystal. The world has its own screen capacities built into it in each particle. The height of this imagination, a digital interface implanted directly into the eyeball, not only augments the bejeweled surface of what it sees with data feeds, it exerts the ability to shape-shift what it looks at through the energy of thought. Photography melds with seeing, which melds with shaping. Liquid crystal, the sliminess of matter, is mobilized for a vision of the world that is subject to transformation, improvement, <coughs> beautification in the light of the high-tech, post-human engagement with nature. When everything that happens and has scientific significance operates in the realm of the sub-perceptual, how quaint it is to speak of vision. Edgerton's frozen flux of atomic blasting might be the first pictures of a radical atom an atom made to act for human intent all the way down, releasing in its irradiating blast other radical atoms, free radicals of carbon dioxide to settle in bones and bodies. New radical atoms are, are an amalgamation of the atom bomb and liquid crystals, 
the directing of energy and the harnessing of self-propulsion. The golem was a pile of dust wetted and made into clay, an inanimate thing made animate. The atom too, each atom of each body, each bit of atomic dust, is to be reanimated in the light of the liquid crystal, its own liquid crystal intelligence redoubled and subject to and subject of inputs and outputs, their matter remastered. There are continuous efforts to photograph or image this dust of atoms, these clouds beneath vision, to capture them in all their presence as tiny solid <coughs> balls, our building blocks, such that they might be made to yield to the liquefying pressures of radicality, transformability. If we want to computationally apprehend the atom, then in some way it must become seeable to be imaginable. The sub-perceptual is to be brought into the realm of image, even if only as a blurry grey emanation from an electron microscope, or a pale blue dot, a speck of dust that purports to be an image of an atom, but is actually a quivering, its quivering reflection in light. In this image from 2018, a single strontium atom is illuminated by a laser while suspended in the air by two electrodes caught within a strong electrical field. The two electrodes on each side of the <coughs> tiny dot are two millimetres <coughs> apart. When illuminated by a laser of the right blue-violet colour, the atom absorbs and re-emits light particles sufficiently quickly to be captured in a long exposure from a camera fitted with an extension tube which increases the focal length of the lens. The diameter of a strontium atom is a few millionths of a millimetre. Here it expands beyond itself in the light, in the many light beams over time which excite its orbiting electrons and make them energised and intermittently give off light. Time bleeds into the image. The image bleeds out as a kind of confusion, an impression presented as a fact, a single trapped atom. As if an atom might be trapped. As if it is an atom we see. As if so many encumbrances were not surrounding it. Those electrons, ambivalent between dot and wave, fixed point and fluid skid, are in permanent movement, impossible to observe without changing. As a melee, a crowd, a turba, or turbulent, turbid buzz, in their multiplicity, recorded over long durations, their tracks might be traced and made visible, as if it were one single, singular moment in an atom's life. Our age forces an engagement with materials, with old ones and new ones and their phases, which are bound into developing understandings of knowledge and intelligence. Indeed, new forms of intelligence are said to speed up the generation of new forms of matter. Attention turns to soft matter, colloids, polymers, foams, gels, aerosol, mists, granular materials, liquid crystals, pentatic liquid quasi-crystals, many of which are self-organising and atomically capricious materials with capacities such as birefringence, generalised el elasticity, mesoscopic and intermediate scale, symmetry breaking, degrees of freedom, all coupled with responsiveness to inputs, including us as inputs. In this age, how quaint some old matter such as clay might be. <laughs> The throne stuff that is clay seems like the good and pretty sister of the evil one called plastic who is thrown away but never disappears. We could be, Ernst Bloch thinks, made through and off the clay of an old Bartman jug, a mud composed of weathered granite rock of decomposed feldspar <coughs> drawing water into its crystal structure. We are golems. He was the jug. But did we become the tetrapack? Are we the coffee bar cup? Do things contain us? Tetrapack makes little pyramids of milk as well as colourful packages of juice. It sells these across the world. These are devices and they remake things from the bottom up. Every practice, every process, every hand that is now not a set of fingers curling and uncurling around udders or pots, but rather electrical conduits on touchscreen interfaces triggering micro-events. 
Sometimes the foam on a cappuccino turns sculptural. Now it's the microfoam or froth in which our forms are sculpted or painted, and we can order a selfie chino, self portraits in froth, offered by an upmarket coffee bar, an image of customers' faces on the foamy topping of their drinks. <coughs> Patrons send their headshots via an online messaging app to the barista and are given the choice of either a cappuccino or hot chocolate as their canvas. These seem an emblem of our effervescent social form or foam, proximate bubbles jostling, but not really touching. Our moments of meeting brief and fragile. But froths and foams are especially transient. They are a nothingness held in time together and sold high in the case of coffee, or productive of toxicity in the case of frothy pollution foams, such as those that periodically course through Hyderabad or New De Delhi, result of phosphate detergents and cosmetic waste gushing into rivers and turning them softly solid. Matter is in the process of reinvention. There are new clays that are a byproduct of contemporary production. In China there exist vast lakes consisting of a slow flow of sludge, a radioactive clay that comes there as waste from the rare earth mineral refining factories. These lakes contain tailings, substances left behind once ore has had its economically valuable part stripped out. The leftover settles in the mud, which prevents the toxic tailings from dispersing on the wind into populated areas. Some photographs of these lakes use the quality of particular lights to tease a glistening glow from the murky quagmire which mirrors its relation, the sheeny plastic of a smartphone's casing. These sludgy ponds host the remainder from the chemicals that provide the underside of the liquid crystal touchscreen, the coating that monitors changes in electric state on the screen and is composed of rare earth minerals and metals, highly conductive ones, ones that can be easily deposited on the glass as a film and are optically transparent. A podcast from the Smithsonian notes the following. Oil is, is the blood, steel is the body, but rare earth elements are the vitamins of a modern society. Somehow this stuff that makes our digital society flow and glow is enhanced. The very stuff of life, essential to our metabolism, but needing to be continually deployed, ever augmented, optimised, bought and supplemented. And for those who do not take their vitamins, who have not bought into them, there will be reduced capacity, self-inflicted ailments, a general inability to function in modern society. Our devices, our liquid crystal <coughs> devices and the gestures that we direct at them bind us to each other as if they were just another communicant and not an ever-watching, ever-seeing, ever-hearing, ever-learning, ever-sensing intelligence for those intent on knowing us better, that is, more profitably and securely, than we know each other and ourselves. What is a crime, we might ask? And I just want to end with two quotes that have been running around my head since, uh, since I, I got here and saw the exhibition. And, uh, so apologies to the translators. Um, I want to end with two half-remembered quotes from Brecht uh, in relation to what I've said. So, what is the crime of robbing a bank compared to the crime of owning one? And the second one is from Brecht too. Art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer to smash it. So, thank you.